All right, so this is just a review from what we sort of already did the derivations by hand for the impasse uh, in the absence of capillary pressure and gravity. So remember, impasse stands for implicit pressure, explicit saturation. So we're just going to look at the oil and water equations for these. There they are. We derived those early in the class when we were talking about multiphase flow. And, and once again, we're ignoring gas, so that equation's not there. So we just start with looking at the oil equation alone, and we just do some manipulations to it. So we're just going to expand time derivative using the product rule, and then use the chain rule to get things in terms of pressure. And if we do that, we can identify some terms here that we know to be the compressibility uh, of oil and water and rock from petrophysics. And so we're going to plug those in. And if we do, we get that top equation there. And without going through all the details, because they're identical, we can do the same thing for water and we get the second equation. Okay. So then we're going to add the two equations together and multiply through by the ratio of formation volume factors, G O over G W. So when we do that, we get this equation. And then we have the, the uh, volume fraction constraint that says that the saturation of water plus the saturation of oil should equal 1, which causes this term to go away because the t we're taking the time derivative of 1. Right? So this goes away. And then we identify the total compressibility is this guy. And then we can write this nonsense right here more compactly. Just write it as the uh, porosity times the total compressibility over formation volume factor of water. And then what we're left with is an equation that basically looks like it's in terms of pressure only. Right? So the PDT and some functions of spatial derivatives of pressure. So we call this the pressure equation. But of course, it's not decoupled from saturation because there are saturations in the relative permeability curve. So we call it the pressure equation because you you don't necessarily see saturation in it when you write it that way. So then we take that overall mass balance equation and we can solve it with either of the oil or the water to solve the system <laughs> of equations. We typically use the water equation. And because that equation does include explicit terms in terms of saturation, particularly the time derivative of saturation, we call that the saturation equation. Right? So the way to remember it is you know, the pressure equation has the time derivative of pressure, and the saturation equation has the time derivative of saturation. Right. So those are the two, two equations we want to solve. Then we just plug in our finite difference rules. So we're going to plug in central difference in space, forward difference in time. And we're going to, in the pressure equation, we're going to evaluate it implicitly. So at the n plus 1 time steps, we're going to evaluate the spatial derivative. So you see all the pressures have n plus 1 in them. Okay. We also just, to make the equations a little more compact, introduce this mobility ratio. Just some further manipulations. We multiply through by this guy in lump terms, and we get something that looks very much like what we're used to for the overall mass balance. It's just now. The transmissibilities include contributions from oil and water. Everything's implicit. Everything's evaluated. All the pressures are evaluated at the n plus 1 times. Yep. Uh, you're just multiplying through by this to get things in terms of flow rate. Uh, okay, so then the saturation equation, we use the same thing. We um, use a uh, central difference in space. We're going to assume that we're going to solve the pressure equation first implicitly, so we'll know the pressures. And so the pressures in this equation are the n plus 1 time, uh, time pressures. And then we're going to do forward difference in time on the saturation. And then we do have this one. Uh, the, the one saturation that we have to evaluate here uh, that multiplies those compressibilities, 
And so then we have to choose what to evaluate it. Do we evaluate it at step n plus one or do we evaluate it at step n? If we choose to evaluate it at step n, that gives us an explicit method in terms of uh, saturation because, again, we're going to assume we know the pressures, we've already solved for them, and then we know the old saturation, and so we write the equation like this. So this is explicit saturation. So that's just the equations in summary. And structurally, if you combine the transmissibilities of the oil and water into one transmissibility, overall transmissibility matrix, then the matrix equations look identically to what we had in the single phase case. It's just T is different. Right? B, in fact, is not different at all. Right? So only T is different here. And then this equation, of course, is different. We didn't have a saturation equation in it in the other case. Okay. So like in your example, you said that step B uh, has to change the matrix O. In in that problem, it was o it was only because there was a constant pressure boundary condition. Right. And that changed the O of B up to O. Yeah, if you had a constant pressure boundary condition. Because the, you end up with the, the boundary term. So there are what the T matrices are. Again, it's just the sum of the transmissibility matrix of water, which is identically what we had before, plus the ratio of the formation of volume factors times the transmissibility equation for oil. And this includes the effect of heterogeneity and everything. The only difference here in the heterogeneous case, the half transmissibilities, you have to include the relative permeability term. Right? Other than that, it's all identically the same. The B vector is identical, uh, and then you, you can also split the Q into the, to the contributions from water and oil. And you'll always see that ratio of formation volume factors in the oil term. Also, you can kind of put the saturation in matrix form, and those are what the, the uh, terms are. This uh, compressibility term over here is often negligible, you know, so the, the water saturation change due to accumulation. You can often uh, exclude that term. So, again, in summary, there are the two equations. We're going to solve the one on the left first, then we're going to solve the one on the right. Now, now we see the productivity index appearing there. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So, we solve the one on the left implicitly, solve the one on the right. right? And in a pure impasse method, that's it. You just march forward. Solve the one on the left, solve the one on the right. Go to the next time step and do the same thing, right? But remember what I said, that often uh, that's not accurate enough. So you have to usually iterate on the saturations to some extent. So in that scenario, what you do is solve the one on the left, solve the one on the right, you get the saturations, plug them back at the same time step, plug them back into the one on the left, solve it again, update the saturations again, plug them back in. And you'd continue to do that until your saturations converge. You know, there was some minimal change in the saturations over one iteration. And then once you had that, you'd say it's converged, and you'd take another step in time and do it all over again. So that's, that's for accuracy. Um, we'll talk later about the stability criterion. And we talked about upwinding, right? So. Upwinding is something we have to do due to this convective nature of the saturation in the problem, the fact that this front, this characteristic, moves through the solution. And uh, so in, in 1D, we can always determine, you know, so you upwind, you, you, you always want to evaluate using a, a, a backwards difference method, backwards with respect to the velocity vector, right? So if the flow is moving that way, you want to evaluate the derivatives in a backward fashion that way and vice versa, right? Well, in, in you know, this uh, transport scheme, the flow is constant. I mean, the, the velocity is constant, right? It's Darcy flow, so it's constant. And therefore, uh, you, you know, having a constant velocity that, that's governed by Darcy's law, you can determine the direction of the flow just from the difference in the pressure. So 
inner block transmissibility, it's, you know, again, we talked about that. It's, it's the same as it was before, but except now you have the relative permeability term in it. Um, other than that, everything's the same. You use the harmonic mean for the standard permeability. Um, but this is uh, really what we're going to get to today. So we haven't covered this, but uh, in, the, in the sense of two-phase flow, but you'll see it's, it's essentially what it was for single-phase flow. We just, if we have the, the flow rate, we think of that at any, well, at any grid block I, you can potentially have constant rate well and a constant bottom hole pressure well, then the total rate, I mean the total flow rate would be the sum of the two, and of course in the bottom hole pressure re well, we have to compute the flow rate from the productivity index and the pressure, the difference in the pressure at the, at the well bore and the average pressure in the grid block. So we use the productivity index there, and you'd have one for oil and one for water, okay? And so then the total is the sum of all of those, right? So the total flow rate is the flow rate due to constant rate wells plus bottom hole pressure wells in terms of water and the same thing for um, oil. Right? And so then your pressure and saturation equations become this. Mainly the, the pressure equation is modified by this J matrix where the total J is the same one we had before, the productivity index of water. And just like you, you, you often see with respect to the, the T matrix and the Q matrix, right, the Q vector, you have the, the standard one from single phase flow plus the ratio of the flow making volume factors times the productivity index matrix of oil. And so what are the productivity indices for each phase? Well, again, they're similar to what they were before. Now you just have to include the effects of relative permeability. And so then if you wanted to know what the total productivity index was via this formula, plugging in those guys, then you just have this guy. And the last thing is, you know, and I think we, s we saw this, that you have this CFL condition. Uh, we saw this when I showed you the solution to the Buckley-Levitt problem, right? Um, if you make the, if you, you know, in that problem when I, in order to resolve the shock front, I made delta x smaller. And when I made delta x smaller, then all of a sudden you got these oscillations that appeared in the solution. So then I had to make delta, because I'm deriving the derivative and this, this became a value greater than one. And I was in violation of this condition. So what I had to do is then cut the time step down to, uh, to have a stable formulation. So with that then, 